God's children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People are like icebergs. Maybe you've heard this before, but there is so much more to every single person that you meet than what you see on the surface, just like an iceberg. Uh, For example, it's said that the iceberg that struck Titanic, or rather Titanic struck an iceberg, had about 50 feet of ice above the surface, but beneath the surface there was more than 450 feet of floating massive ice cube deep and another 400 feet in length. There is so much more beneath the surface. And as with icebergs, if you don't tend to what's beneath the surface, if you're not mindful of it, it can hurt you and it can hurt others. And what we want to do in this series that we're beginning this morning is take a deep dive and tend to some of the things that are deep beneath the surface for all of us that affect the life we live above the surface. What we want to do is take a look at some of our deep motivations, our hurts, our worries, our fears, our wounds, and our needs, and see how they're shaping the lives that we live above the surface of the water. But more than anything, what we want to do is is apply the truth of God's love in Jesus Christ to those things that are deep beneath the surface so that we will not only have big things beneath the surface, but we will have things that are being helped and healed and transformed by the power of God's love so that the next time we bump into somebody or somebody bumps into us, we'll do a little less damage. Now, first things first, we need to have a a spiritual understanding of what all this stuff is that's underneath the surface of the water for each and every one of us. And that's where Romans chapter 8 is really helpful. Let's look again at what Paul says. In fact, I'm going to back up the reading just a little bit and start at verse 12 to give us a little more context. Listen to this. Paul writes, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, daughters, children of God. Here and in the larger context of the book, Paul is talking about two forces that are at work in the heart and mind of every believer. The first force that he talks about is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is promised to all who believe and are baptized. And Paul says it is a powerful, potent force moving underneath the surface in the hearts and minds of all those who believe. He he likens it to something that's hereditary. In the same way that, that you might have your mom's eyes or your dad's hairline, All those who are born again into God's family, they have the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is at work in us to transform us. But he talks about another force that's at work in us. He calls it the flesh. The Greek word, which is really fun to say, is sarx. That's the word that's usually translated as flesh. It can also be translated as plain and simple body. Paul puts that label on this other force that's at work within us. Now, stay with me, it it gets a little dense here, but what Paul is talking about when he talks about this this force of the flesh that we must war against, he's putting a label on two other things that are at work in our hearts and minds. The first is our own corrupted impulses and instincts, our urges, wishes, wants, and needs, all of which have been ruined by the reality of sin. And, And the other thing is... this this divine pressure that we feel. Paul says it comes from the law of God. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, even if you consider yourself a a non-believer, all of us, even you, feel this divine pressure. It's that that moral pressure that's within each one of us that that tells us deep down in our heart that, that we should be good, that we should be kind, that we should be loving, that we probably shouldn't kill, that it's probably not right to steal. It's, it's that moral pressure that we all feel to be right and good. Well, Paul says that's the law, the pressure of the law. But the problem with the pressure of the law is that because of our sinfulness, we can never relieve that pressure. 
We can never be as good as we know we're supposed to be. We can never be as kind or compassionate or generous as we know we're supposed to be. And these two things come together. This pressure to be and to do and perform and also these corrupted urges and impulses that we have inside of us, these things come together. And Paul says they form what we call the flesh. And Paul says if you don't, if you don't tend to the flesh by the power of the Spirit, the flesh will enslave you. It, it, it will control you. It will, it will drive your life into a ditch. This pressure that you feel to, to do and be and perform and these corrupted and corroded impulses that you have, if you, don't, if you don't keep it in check by the power of the Spirit, you'll get shipwrecked. And so Paul is talking about these two forces and he says the, the force of the flesh needs to be kept in check by the power of the Spirit. And when we talk about all the things that are on the underside of the iceberg, what we're talking about is that flesh. We're talking about that pressure that you feel and those corrupt urges that you have that drive in so many ways the life we live above the surface. And this force of the flesh manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And we're going to talk about a lot of different ways in which it, it makes itself known underneath the surface of our lives. And today we're going to talk about one that I think probably most of us can relate to, especially those of us, quite frankly, who are parents. Now, now I don't think that I really deal with this one. We're going to talk about me next week, okay? Uh, just so you know, next week is all about me. This week is about, it's about those of you who have this deep need to be needed, the, the, the profound pressure that so many of us feel to be essential to the lives of others. It's a combination of the, the divine pressure that you feel to be as loving and caring and generous as possible and, and your own urge and impulse to be essential in the lives of those you love. And it all comes together in this deep, insatiable need to be needed. Now, when I say that there is underneath the surface for some of us a deep need to be needed, some of you are like, oh, that is so me. He's been reading my text messages. <laughs> and then there are some of you like me who are like, mm, that's not really me, but I'm glad it's them. Because the people who have a need to be needed, they make life amazing for the rest of us. You, you, you guys who have this underneath the surface, you, you are the best people. You make life warm and uh, full of love and, and full of thoughtful touches all over the place. You are the ones with the greatest gift of hospitality. You have the ability to, to welcome people into your home and make it feel like it's our home too. You, you remember everybody's birthday. Not only do you remember everybody's birthday, you have this way of like finding these incredibly thoughtful gifts. Like how do you do it? Do you keep a running list throughout the year of, of gifts to get other people just to make the rest of us look bad? You give incredible gifts. You will run errands for us that we didn't, need, that we didn't know need to be ran. You will give up on your own weekend plans in order to help us solve our problems. You will make sure that our moms get flowers on Mother's Day. You'll pick out the clothes that we'll wear to our important event. You are incredible people. You add so much life and love to this world. And we want you to know that we are so thankful for all that you bring and all that you give. Your need to be needed makes life really good for us. And we know that. But today, I also want to show some empathy for you. Because I know that with that need to be needed underneath the surface of your life, there, there's also a, there's a shadow side to it. There's, there's some baggage to it. As Paul says, it's still a force of the flesh, that deep need to be needed. It's still a force of the flesh, and, and you can become enslaved to it. And so I just want to recognize how that how that part of it makes itself known for you. I, I know enough uh, of those who, who really wrestle with this. I, I've got a lot of people in my life who have a need to be needed and I'm, I'm the recipient of all that. <laughs> but, but I know enough and as a pastor, I've had enough conversations to know that, 
that when this is beneath the surface, this, this need to be needed can also make itself known in, in the form of a lie that you start to believe about yourself. Not only do you think that you need to be needed, you will start to believe this lie. It sounds something like this. I am nothing if I'm not needed. I am nothing if I'm not needed. And if you start to believe that lie, I am nobody if I'm not needed by everybody, that itself can start to bear some really debilitating, enslaving fruit. It can bear, it can bear fruit in the form of, um, it can bear fruit in the form of codependency and possessiveness over people where you so desperately need to be needed by certain people in your life that you struggle to let them go and, and, and be their own person. It, it can manifest itself in an inability to rest. It can manifest itself in an inability to take care of yourself because you are so busy taking care of everybody else that your own physical and mental and spiritual well-being suffers because you say, well, I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm too busy making sure everybody else's stuff is okay. It can also manifest itself in pride, where you find yourself thinking or saying things like this, they better hope nothing ever happens to me in this family. <laughs> because if, if something happens to me, this whole family falls apart. You ever thought that? You might have a need to be needed, and you might be wrestling with the lie, I am nothing if I'm not needed, because it manifests itself oh so quickly in pride. You know what else it does? It, it can easily bear fruit of bitterness and anger. We're, we're going to get spiritual for just, uh, just a second again. Um, you, what you're doing when you, when, you, when you let the need to be needed underneath the surface drive and control you, especially when you buy into the lie that I'm nothing if I'm not needed and essential to all these people, what, what you're doing is committing in so many ways idolatry. What you're doing is, is turning the people that you serve into a functional savior, thinking that if you give them enough, do enough, love them enough, that they will give you something in return that will make you enough. And, and that, my friends, is idolatry. You're, you're setting these other people as, up as false saviors, and false saviors always disappoint you. Because the only person that can truly satisfy you through the gifts that he gives to you is Jesus Christ. Everybody else will let you down. And when you set people up to fail, a lot of times unknowingly, when you set people up to fail, saying, if I give to you, eventually you're going to give something back to me that makes me whole and happy. When they fail you, it frustrates you and angers you in a deep deep way. And all the things that you once did for them gladly become a long list of accusations that you levy at them. I cancel all my plans for the weekend to help you. I pick out that shirt. That shirt you wear? I pick out that shirt. Your mother wouldn't even have gotten flowers if it weren't for me. I run errands for you you don't even know that you need. I remember everybody's birthday. What's your dad's birthday? You don't even know your dad's birthday. It becomes anger and sometimes an explosion. And, and what, can, what can really happen is sometimes, oftentimes, when it explodes in anger and bitterness, it can be, and gosh, I, I know this, this, this might be hard to hear, when it explodes in anger like that, it can actually in and of itself be an act of manipulation. Because what you're, what you're trying to do is in a last ditch effort of, of a giant outburst, what you're trying to do is get them to give to you once again some recognition and affirmation that they cannot give and they will frustrate you once more. When you buy the lie that I'm, I, am, I am utterly essential to everyone around me and, and I'm nothing if I'm not needed, it bears terrible fruit, fruit like pride, fruit like an inability to care for yourself, fruit like possessiveness over other people, and, and fruit, 
Fruit like we've just talked about. So, that, so then what do you do? Well, remember, Paul says that there's another force at work in those who believe and are baptized, not just the force of the flesh underneath the surface, but, but there's also this gift of the Spirit that has been given to you. Listen again to what Paul says. Paul says now, verse 15, he says, Remember, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Paul doesn't give the church that's wrestling with the forces underneath the surface a tactic to defeat them. He gives them a truth to lean on. The truth is that those who are baptized into Christ Jesus have the full force of the Holy Spirit within them. And and that Holy Spirit within them is evidence that they are members of God's family. And not just like fringe members, like that distant cousin whose name you don't know. But, But sons, daughters of the Father... And he says that spirit that's within you enables you in moments of weakness, in moments of struggle, in moments when the flesh is rearing its ugly head to cry out to God, not just as God, but to call him father, not even just father, but to call him dad, knowing that he will come running to rescue you and help you. That is how much he loves you. He gives them that truth to lean on. Here's what I need you to know. The only cure for those who need to be needed by others is to know that you are not needed but wanted by God himself. Let me say that again. The only cure for those who are drunk in the idea that they they need to be needed by others is to know that you are not needed by God but you are wanted, you are liked, you are loved by God. That is the only cure. Apart from all that you do, you are loved by him. You are his child. Moms, it's, it, it's your day. I mean, you, you tell me. Your kid frustrates you. Your children embarrass you. One day, your kids are going to go to the therapist and blame you. <laughs> it's part of the deal. Your kids are going to frustrate you, upset you in a thousand different ways. And yet, that kid, no matter, no matter how many times they bother you, upset you, or break your heart, no matter how old they are, if they cry out to you and you hear the word, Mom, Mom, in their voice, no one will be able to stop you from running to help and to rescue, will they? I'd like to see them try. No one will be able to stop them. Because you have this depth of love in you for your children that drives you to respond to their need, to hear their cry, and to run to them, and they could be two or 26, doesn't matter. You have this urge to lift them into your arms and to hug them so tight that you make all the broken pieces fit back together. That's who you are, right? That's who you are. And what Paul is saying is this. Remember, I know that that force underneath the surface of the flesh is strong for you, but remember, remember, the Spirit of God is in you. And the Spirit of God is evidence that you are loved ferociously and unendingly by Him. Apart from what you do, that is who you are. That's who you are. The cure for needing to be needed by others is knowing you are wanted by God. So uh, I, I want to give you a couple gifts. If you, if you really wrestle with this and you want to fan into flame that knowledge of, of God's spirit within you and your status as his child loved apart from your performance, I, I want to offer three gifts to you that I think can help encourage that other force in you to fight against the flesh. And the three things are this. I, I, I want to encourage you, give you permission to believe and receive and rest. Let's start with believe. You who need to be needed, you do so many amazing things for the rest of us. And we try really hard to tell you that we appreciate you and to tell you that we love you. Here's the problem, though. Very often, you either don't believe us or you just quickly dismiss it. That's fine, it's fine, I'm happy to do it. Fine, fine, happy to do it. It would be helpful to you 
if when we say to you, hey, hey, thank you, or I love you, if you would take a beat, take a breath, and believe us. Because here's what we need you to know. We mean it. We mean it. And you need to hear it. Uh, the second gift is permission to, permission to receive care and generosity and service from others. So often you are so busy doing for others that no one does for you. But you need to be on the receiving end of other people's service and sacrifice. Uh, that's what makes days like today so important. Moms, you need to, you need to be on the receiving end of, of care and generosity and sacrifice. You, you need to receive that because it helps reinforce this truth that you are worthy of love apart from your performance and that you are accepted, affirmed, and valued by the people that matter most. Mom, you need to let us pick up the house today the wrong way. <laughs> you, you need to let us fold the towels the wrong way. You need to let us load the dishwasher the wrong way so that you can sneak back in hours later and load it the right way. <laughs> My, <laughs> some of you are feeling that one, yeah. The cups don't go on the bottom. <laughs> you need to let us cook a meal for you. You need to let us pay way too much money for flowers for you so that you can tend to them and take care of them so we get our money out of them. <laughs> you, you need to let us do these things. You need to receive that. Not just because we owe you, because we need you to know that your needs matter too. Because we know you don't often believe that. You also have permission, an invitation to rest. So much of what we're talking about today is a spiritual issue. You have permission to rest in the truth of God's love for you. Listen to me, if, if you are drunk on the idea that you are holding everything together with your two hands, that you are the linchpin in everybody's life, if you are drunk on that idea, it is a sign that you have been too far away for too long from the love and grace and goodness of God. It is time to come home. It is time to come home and sit with his promises and hear how he loves you apart from your performance. It is time to come home and receive his gifts. Remember that you too are chosen in baptism to be fed at his table, to be given his word, to be surrounded by people who need nothing from you but to sit next to you and sing alongside of you. You need to come home and rest in the truth of God's love for you apart from performance and let it melt away that part of the iceberg that says, I am essential to everyone no, you're not. He is, and he loves you. Amen. That's what you need. That's what you need. Let me give you one last verse from Romans 8. One last little nugget to leave you with. Romans 8, verse 16, Paul says this. The Holy Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And here's the kicker. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ... Paul says that, that as the beloved status as a child of God settles within you, the reality that you have an inheritance starts to overwhelm you. You, as a child of God, have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. Kids get an inheritance from mom and dad of some way, shape, or form. You have an inheritance from God the Father. Uh, that inheritance is a place at his table in eternity. That inheritance is a life where every, every fear is vanquished, every tear is wiped away, every need in every heart is satisfied. 
Everyone feels welcomed, wanted, and whole. That is your inheritance, and it's guaranteed for you in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is your inheritance. And Paul says that inheritance, that knowledge, is meant to melt away the power of the flesh because it can't, it can't convince you that you need to live in fear. I have an inheritance that comes from God. Look at how loved I am. It's meant to transform your understanding of the world. We I mean, think of it like this way. What if tomorrow you woke up and you discovered that, that, that Elon Musk, all of his you know, issues and weirdness and rockets aside, Elon Musk made you, made you the recipient of all his wealth when his days were done. Yeah, you get the spaceships to Mars, you get whatever we're calling Twitter, and you get his $200 billion. That is guaranteed for you. I imagine that even though that, that inheritance is is not a right now thing, it's a someday thing for you, it would change how you live and how you feel in the present moment. It, it might even allow you to go from working for wealth and peace to working from wealth and peace because you know what is yours. Think of all the inheritance you have in Jesus Christ. You who need to be needed, it is meant to free you from working for a wealth of affirmation that you will never get to working, to working from affirmation and acceptance and peace that you possess today and will experience in full tomorrow and can never be taken away from you. That's what you have and who you are. I'll close with this. The writer, Anne Lamont, once said this. She said, there really are places in the heart you don't even know exist until you love a child. That's true for every one of us who has a little one in our lives that we love, whether they're your children, your grandchildren, your niece, or your nephew, a, a kid in your classroom. But once you get to know the joy of loving a little one, it opens up parts of your heart you didn't know existed, a depth of joy, a depth of grief, a depth of celebration, a depth of sorrow that you didn't know existed. Your heart grows 10 times larger. It really does. But the same is true for those who have a need to be needed. You have huge hearts, massive hearts. Your heart is so much bigger than mine. And, and that's what we love about you. It holds so much thoughtfulness, so much love, so much compassion, so much generosity, so much. We, we love that about you. And, and we are thankful for all that we receive from you. But, 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 but hear this. Because we love you, we want freedom for you. We want you to know the freedom of believing us when we tell you we love you. We want you to know the freedom of receiving the same thing that you so often give. We, we want you to know the joy, the joy of possessing forever in Jesus Christ what you could never get from loving and serving other people because it is yours. Amen.